You want to talk about Martin Scorsese's latest movie? Absolutely. So it's called Killers of the Flower Moon. It's three and a half hours long. That's the first thing everybody's going to tell you. Listen, this guy at some point in the last couple of decades, he doesn't care how long his movies are. Okay. He does not care. And you know, if it, if it premieres on a streaming platform, he really doesn't care. <laughs> uh, when he made a uh, Irishman, right. That was like, I think four and a half hours. That thing was way longer. And I really enjoyed the Irish Irishman. I, loved it. I thought I did it in pieces. Absolutely. Um, and there were a couple, I, I thought the technology maybe was a little bit distracting where they're de-aging them, especially when like yeah. Robert De Niro's character is like throwing something or like trying to kick somebody while they're down. He's like, that's an old man with a young person's face. It, it wasn't, it obviously wasn't perfect. But when you do get to the end of the movie or closer to the end of the movie and you actually do see an elderly Joe Pesci, like our present day Joe, Joe Pesci. And then you compare it to like when they try to make him look 50 or so, you're like, oh, that's pretty good. And I thought the story was like it, it gripped me the whole entire time. Yeah. And I think that's the thing about Scorsese. It's like I call them like crime, crime hangs where mm. you just like you, you you hang out and there's crimes and you and they build and they build and they build. And you're I don't know. I'm always interested and I'm always gripped by them. Let's see. Departed, Irishman, Goodfellas. Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, so many of his movies follow a pretty similar structure, which is that there's a criminal um, enterprise of some kind. They establish a status quo about it. Some, you know, some main character who is morally deficient <laughs> or immorally committed to the crime enterprise. So there's like a status quo that's established in, in kind of like a prologue first 20 minutes. And then it kind of just gets off to the races and mm. it starts kind of like time hopping and moving and going faster and faster and faster and, and problems catch up with people. And it kind of like, it's just like a battering ram to the end. I feel like. Yeah. Um, and like this movie, uh, maybe others will disagree and say that it was slow. I found, I did not find it slow. I thought that um, every scene had its place, you know, cause you can be long and still be reasonably paced. It just means that there's a lot more content, right? Like, yeah. like long does not necessarily mean slow. And I was, I was watching this, uh, you know, uh, digitally here. I could have taken breaks, but I was, I was hooked. I watched the whole thing in one sitting. I, I would watch a low IQ Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he loves, he loves his wife, but he's like, so a low IQ and <laughs> like, can't help but do crimes for his um uncle. He had this kind of monkey face. Yeah. He, he did something to his face. I don't know if he had like something in his mouth or something. He was doing something with his kind of underbite. He did that a little yeah. bit when he was on cocaine in Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> get off the phone. Get off the fucking phone. Idiot. Get out of the way. That's a great movie. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, when, I mean, that came out, what, like 12 years ago or something? And I remember when that came out, I was like, how old is this Martin Scorsese? 70, <laughs> 70 years old or something? And he's yeah. making a movie that's that's like a like a manic Tarantino movie. Um, like, this is impressive shit. And now he's 81 years old and De Niro is 80. D De Niro really impressed me. Like, one, I didn't even realize he was in the movie because all the marketing materials is... Um, the you know the Molly character and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, and so I was like, oh, what what is this about? Something about Native Americans? And then when Robert De Niro shows up for most of the movie, and he's like acting his ass off. He's so good. Yeah. He's way up in that character, you know. Yeah, um, that's what he does best. He, I mean, he's a, he's one of the method he's actors of, of the nineteen seventies. <laughs> like that's who he. You know, I was thinking about this. I was like, Martin Scorsese, right? One of the finest filmmakers to have ever touched a camera still making movies to this day robert de niro one of the most you know celebrated actors of many generations de niro goes back and forth on quality of films of course. but scorsese in particular has been making beautiful art on film non-stop his entire life <laughs> that's incredible and it is like, incredible. That's it, you know, it's it's like Doug Walker. <laughs> it's like, it's like, like he's, he's the Doug Walker of movies. <laughs> you're right. Like I believe that he would do it for an audience of zero. He obviously, you know, if you're 81, I got look. I'm tired. I'm 38. And so you would say Steven Spielberg is James Rolfe, is what you're saying? Yes, that's a per that's a great analogy. Jaws by one of the best directors, Steven Spielberg. I don't know who Stanley Kubrick is, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. I uh, <laughs> I imagine that when you're 81, you got better things to do than run around on a movie set and 
uh, intensely make, you know, and be away from your family and all the rest of it. But this guy, if he's not making a feature film, he, you know, he's making a documentary, he's working on some other thing. Like he is, he, he's not like Tarantino where he kind of takes his time with the next one and, you know, his meth- and, and props to Tarantino. He's made a life of making films too. And he's made, he'll have made 10 of them and that's awesome. But Scorsese has made many more than 10. Um, he, he just doesn't stop. And yeah, they're not all hits for me. You know, like Shutter Island, I thought was a miss. There's a few like that. I, I, I don't know. I think like every Scorsese movie is worth your time. Well, you made that, was that a Hugo movie, right? Hugo or whatever. Oh yeah, was that was that? an interesting movie. Yeah. It was interesting, but I didn't, I didn't quite like it. But no, it I didn't like it at all. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, his, att- it was a, his attempt at like, maybe I'll, maybe I can make a family movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah he, he's one of a kind, man. And, and he's got that like great bouncy attitude. But he's always kind of telling you what he's going to do. You know, he's yeah. kind of really excited he's, to get in front of the camera and do it. He's on like TikTok with his daughter or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. They're... He's incredible. He's incredible. This movie wasn't perfect or anything, but you know what? It looked gorgeous. The performances were good. The story was worthy and you and unique. You know, like there's there's a lot of stories about um, you know, the plight of Native Americans and the way that the country developed. And but I've never I I don't know. I didn't know anything about this story, about you know, just yeah. kind of this this, um, you know, for those who want to know about the movie, it's about in the, in the early 20th century in like the Oklahoma, uh, Missouri area, they come into oil basically. Like they, they, they're, they're living on, on oil fields and they become a very wealthy, um, uh, tribe of native Americans. They end up partnering with Robert De Niro's character, a guy named, uh, King Hill goes by the name of King Hill, who's like a major investor and is able yeah. to help them build, hospitals and amenities and all these things, you know, that, that kind of help them make their money go as far as possible. Um, as he would put it, bring them into the 20th century, you know, yeah. um, uh, cars and everything else industry. And, uh, his nephew, Leonardo DiCaprio comes back from world war one and he's, you know, kind of a dummy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and the goal is, Hey, let's subtly marry into these native families And, you know, a lot of them are unhealthy. They're dying of, you know, they have trouble with alcoholism or they're dying of diabetes, especially, you know, the women are going to die or, you know, they're not going to make it past 60. We're going to inherit all of the estates. We're going to have the head rights to a lot of these estates and subtly like our people are going to kind of own this land and, uh, and own this money. Um, so Leo actually falls in love with this, you know, this character, Molly, played by a, a, an actress who's nominated and I thought was really, really good in the movie. I, she was great. She, she has such a good look to her and she has a good presence. Confidence too. She had a real confidence on screen, you know, especially uh, acting opposite Leo. Um, you, you, you might detect somebody who's intimidated, but she really, it really, I don't know. I thought she really embodied the character. And then the character kind of also like her soul dies <laughs> across two and a half hours. Mm. And, um, and I, I feel like she really like tracked the character on that. Um, cause in addition to this kind of sneaky marry into it kind of thing, um, there's also like a rash of murders, um, of, of kind of key Osage people. Um, they kind of go for a low hanging fruit at first. Like if, if, if one of them is like a real alcoholic, they're like, Oh, we could make that look like a suicide. Or if mm-hmm. one of them's mouthing off all the time, we can be like, Oh, it, it was coming to her. Um, and of course, as, as, as there's several murders that are, that go uninvestigated, um, you know, the Osage leadership kind of gets wise to it, but they continue to think that Robert De Niro is their buddy for a while. Yeah. And then and spo- Robert, Robert De Niro is like paid off all the sheriffs. And so they're on his side basically. And so, yeah, the native, they like basically have to go to the president of the United States to get, yeah. get them to investigate. You got to basically go on a train and go to Washington and, and, and you know, and the, the FBI had just formed at that time. So that maybe we can get a federal investigation into this. Sent down from Washington, D.C. to see about these murders. Hmm. They're also like uh, insulin was new. And, you know, it's it's implied spoilers. Spoilers for all this. It's implied that like the insulin shots um, that like Leo's wife was getting, for instance, uh, you know, was actually poisoned in some way or making her sicker in some way. I don't think they ever reveal it. She, she's like, what was in the insulin shots? And he's like, insulin. Well, I mean, he's he, he is given a another viral by uh, Robert De Niro and he's told to put it in there and he does it. So, Oh, oh okay. yeah. And it was shot on 35, except for the low light nighttime stuff. Some of that was shot on the, um, the Venice Scorsese also co-wrote the screenplay. 
you know, so it's screenplay by Martin Scorsese and some other guy. Pretty awesome. I was I was reading the uh, the Wikipedia page for just the history, and they they do a pretty good job of sticking to the history. It seems mm-hmm. like uh, obviously stuff is played out up for dramatic to make it more dramatic, but it, I mean that's it's the first. It's a very complicated rash of murders and uh, it's very tangled up so that he and they he does a really good job of making it into a, a narrative that you can follow he's a lot of you know uh players involved because they get a lot of scumbags involved and and uh, i thought it was pretty easy to track even with uh, with all these players involved yeah unlike irishman where you're like i i don't think this guy killed jimmy hoffa <laughs> <laughs> uh, at 81 i mean you know we just lost carl, carl leathers at what at um oh. 76 or something he was a, a guy in good health like things can happen like people you get to an age where it's like if if you die suddenly of, of cardiac arrest or something like nobody is shocked and so like you know like this every movie at this point could be martin scorsese's last movie it just could be um and mm-hmm. I'm sure he has said it himself. He's like, oh, I, you know, you start to get to a point where you can only make so many pictures, you know, uh, it's like, you got to <laughs> choose his projects very wisely and very carefully. It, almost every waking moment of, of this dude's life has been making beautiful movies. And this one's no different. And I was thinking, I was like, you know, Goodfellas is, it, you could argue was, was kind of one of their magnum opuses. Mm. You know, the one, his tombstone will probably say something about Goodfellas oh, yeah. and Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, you know, probably those <laughs> Jesus. Two, yeah, right. Yeah, it was like the guy is just <laughs> bursting with uh, film history. Um, but it, when they made Goodfellas, you know, that was 1990. Uh, they were De Niro and Scorsese. They were 47 and 48. You know, they were older, right? Yeah. You know, they, like, and they had this much career left after that. That's incredible. It is incredible. Like 50, 50 plus years of this shit um, of giving us. I mean, like, what what a gift to like the planet Earth. Um, Mm-hmm. to give us these movies. Yeah. I respect Tarantino's whole, like, Hey, I got to put a cap on it at some point thing. But I'm like, Martin Scorsese didn't put a cap on it, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it for a long time. I've been doing it for 30 years. What a pathetic bitch. Very impressed. I, I didn't expect to like the movie that much. I don't know why. I just, there was something about like the, the stills I saw in marketing. I'm like, oh, I don't know. That looks kind of, it didn't sell me on the promotional images. And then when I just started watching it, just, Okay. It just is grabbed me and it didn't let go. So you're like, oh, not another evil white person movie. And then you're like, this is a really good evil white person movie. Yeah, exactly. You just have to write them good. <laughs> you're like, you can make evil white people movies. You just don't make them fucking like two dimensional and dumb and cartoonish. Yeah. You don't need to like, yeah, have, yeah, make them like lazy, sloppy, and just have like, two-dimensional political speeches in the middle of them. And people will say, they'll be like, no, 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 that wasn't bad because it's woke. It was bad because it's bad. And I'll be like, yes. But it was, it's like when Fat Bastard was like, I eat because I'm unhappy. And I'm unhappy <laughs> because I eat. I'm like, I eat because I'm unhappy. And I'm unhappy because I eat. It's it's bad because it's woke and it's woke because it's bad. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's yeah. kind of both. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's just really low IQ. It's like, it's, it's just, it's just saying the most popular thing you can possibly say and repeating the same words and lines and stuff. But we're, we're you know, a movie like this is, um, you know, it might check some boxes for people and yet it's compelling, fascinating, beautiful storytelling. You know, yeah. that's all, that's all I'm like as a filmmaker, as a fellow filmmaker, you know, as a contemporary mm-hmm. of Martin Scorsese, uh, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that's all I'm looking for. Oh yeah, exactly. I don't yeah. you almost think it's gonna die with Martin Scorsese? Yeah, I mean, well, who else? So we're very lucky because we got Oppenheimer this year, another movie shot on film, and uh, very similar in a lot of ways. Where you know it has this kind mm. of barreling narrative, and it's historical, and it kind of leads up to this you know court, this legal case, and they actually they have a lot in common. So I feel very lucky that we had we got both of those movies in the same year. In other words, movies that have big resources. Um, and the, and the point of that is to try to make the best possible movie. <laughs> yeah. So Nolan for sure. And Tarantino is another one and he's, but he's going to be quitting soon. So Nolan will be carrying a hell of a torch. I think, you know, of course there's other filmmakers. Of course there's David Fincher and, you know, and there's, there's other people for sure. But, but I don't know. Um, I remember movies like this used to come out kind of a lot, not, you yeah. know, you got a, you got quite a few of them. 
And then, and what we get now is different. What we get now is like a lot, a whole lot of Marvel. And this is the guy who critiqued Marvel and everybody was like, oh, what a, what an arrogant prick. I'm like, you're, you're talking about Martin Scorsese here. Like you're talking about somebody who, you know, all he said was like, those, those aren't really pictures. That's not cinema. That's an amusement <laughs> yeah. I like pictures. <laughs> According to Scorsese, it's not cinema. I got to take a look at that, you know? I was like, well, he's right. Those are not, I mean, you know, I love me some Guardians 3 and I, some of them are really wonderful films, but. I don't, I don't think you can really put them up against Killers of the Flower Moon and Goodfellas and Rachel Gold. <laughs> um, I, I know what he means, but like it's a different. I, yeah, thing. I know what he means. And good for him for being like, I'm 81 and I'm going to try to prove my own point. No, yeah, I mean, I, you, you hope if you're 81, you have that much stamina oh to do God. any anything, anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. Get out, you know, to go, like to, yeah, to get out of bed and go do something interesting. Let alone. Um, you know, another Oscar contender. No, no problem. Here you go. Nope. Yeah. And it's an, and like you, you see it and you're like, of course it's an Oscar contender. Of yeah. course it is. Yeah. It, be- yeah, it, it should be. Obviously is right. Yeah. I think it's ridiculous that like a movie like Barbie would be in the same uh, category. <laughs> I, you've, you haven't seen it, but yes, well, no, I know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, but I, 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 I agree with it, even though you haven't seen it. <laughs> I, I got it all figured out. But, you know, I, I feel a little bit bad for Echo because like the one thing Echo had oh. going for it was like, oh, this is like a cool representation thing. And it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, let me uh, let me show you a good version. So we saw them so close together. Yeah, I know. Oh, it's bad. <laughs> it has the same like the the mother character is uh the grandmother character in uh echo yeah it's bad. yeah her name is the actress's name is tanto cardinal and she not only was in echo and killers of the flower moon she was also in dances with wolves she's yeah. if she shows up man to these native american movies dances with wolves is a great fucking movie too by the way oh yeah some other major uh names show up in the middle of the movie that you weren't expecting like brendan fraser and yeah. uh, and john lithgow He's a little- yeah, he's the, the 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 lawyers on each side. Yeah, and you know, it, it was a lot of times John Lithgow plays kind of a like a sometimes he'll play a villain or he'll play somebody who's kind of like crazy or it was great to just see John Lithgow play like a like a man with integrity. Yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was really good casting. Yeah, and I, I like uh, yeah, and I like Brendan Fraser as the bombastic like criminal lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was really good too. Um, Good for that's good for, my client. He is my. <laughs> <laughs> that's my client. <laughs> that was awesome. Ernest Burkhart is my client. Oh, the rules prohibit. I demand the opportunity. Man, I swear, Breaking Bad and Darren Aronofsky, they have like delivered a lot of like casting choices to these bigger name directors. They they've you know. Because hmm. uh, uh, Jesse Plemons, who of course played Todd in uh, Breaking Bad, he's he he's the FBI. Oh yeah, agent. yeah yeah. Somebody pointed out our friend Zach was like, um, might it have made sense for Jesse Plemons to be the Leo character and for Leo to be the FBI agent? And I'm like, yeah, that actually would have been better casting. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, could you imagine? I could totally imagine Jesse Plemons as that lower IQ, uh, mm. doing what he's told, maybe occasionally being charming. You know, uh, I, I could see that a little bit more easily. But Leo, yeah, did, I, pe- some people are saying Leo wasn't so good. I thought Leo was great. I think it's a, it was a good, well, all around, well cast, well acted movie. Good for Leo, man. For he's he, he's another one at this point. It's like you've spent your entire life, like at a certain point. You know, again, <laughs> I joke about Doug Walker, but at a certain point, I have to believe. <laughs> <laughs> I have to believe that you must actually like doing this. You must actually like com- coming to a set, and and focusing on a character and being in a movie and trying to make the movie really good. Like Leo DiCaprio doesn't show up to some movie that's going to be shitty, you know. <laughs> Um, like, well, I guess I'll do it. Like, no, he, I he's get not going to show up to like a Marvel Disney plus show. No, he's not going to do it. He's going to be in cool movies that, that are good. The fucking length aside, which I, to me is just the most like superficial critique you could give of this thing. Cause again, like, I, I think it's paced perfectly well, especially it has that Scorsese thing where it's like, sometimes you'll hop a year, you know, uh, uh like unceremoniously, like the movie moves through time pretty mm. briskly. And I, I also thought, you know, Leo actually does look like he's like 50 in this thing. Mm-hmm. And and they're kind of calling him like boy and, you know, youngster. And <laughs> and I was thinking, I was like, you know, and they made no effort to make him look younger. And I thought maybe that's actually maybe that kind of works because maybe back, like if he's supposed to be 30. Oh, yeah. 
maybe back then, like a 30 year old looked like a fucking 50 year old. You know? Oh yeah. Especially if you come back from world war one, you're going to look like a 50 year old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you come, you go in there 18 years old and you come back at 22 looking like Leo. You got something, you got a prosthetic in your mouth to make you <laughs> like with the frowny face. So this was, you know, I, I, I often, I'm like, I don't want to watch any of these Oscar movies. I've never heard of. I'm totally glad I watched this. And uh, yeah. maybe there's another one in there. Some people are saying nice things about holdovers. That's Alexander Payne, right? Right. That, dude, that dude makes a cool movie now and again. There's a, a lot I was actually interested in watching. So I guess I'll watch a few more. You think there's hope for, for cinema? Um, It's hard to say. It's hard to say because um, I don't know. I think this year is going to be, you know, maybe outside of like Deadpool yeah. 3 and Dune 2. I don't know. It's hard to say. We've said it before, but it feels like we're on the brink of like it'll it'll start to make sense to take risks again. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think there is I can feel course correction. It just feels like the the talent pool, a lot of the talent pool is like pathologically untalented. Yeah. And, and maybe that's a covid thing or something. I don't know, maybe it's like a generational thing where it's like well, we haven't really had like the proper training or we haven't really like been exposed to ideas or we haven't allowed ourselves to be exposed by ideas or we're addicted to social media. So it's all we know, but there's like a creative tunnel vision. There's like a, a creative incest where everything's about the same shit, you know, like generational trauma. We, we can only tell one story. And by the way, that story looks a whole lot like what everybody's saying on Twitter. And, you yeah. know, like it's, and a, I, yeah. And the, uh, I think a lot of people who are hardworking might see Hollywood and be like, I'm going to opt out of that. And yeah. do something tangentially related, but not strictly Hollywood. Which is a bummer because it means it's like, well, then they're not going to make a movie, right? They're going to make some other yeah. thing. And yeah, exactly. I like movies. And I like watching this reminded me, like, I like movies. I sometimes forget. Yeah. Like maybe because every almost every time I watch something, I'm like, ugh. we need, we need good, general. artful, deliberate movies with cool performances, with good screenplays. We need funny movies. We need funny TV shows. Here's what I want you to do, Hollywood. Focus on comedy for a little while. Get it right. Wasn't there like a like a raunchy rom-com that did well? Oh, Anyone But You. Anyone But You. It's a romantic comedy. I think it did fairly well. And uh, because it was just like a like a raunchy rom-com. People just want to see that. Yeah, (laughs) I really I, I, I believe that in our in our future, there will be another really big comedy that everybody the culture needs it so badly to sit in a room mm. together and laugh. I mean, really, like, I know. right. It's very important. You know, whenever like there's a cultural fight, whenever we're fighting, like comedy is the first thing to go because it's like, it's it, cause it's fraught. It's risky. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it might show your hand about what you think is funny and what's not funny. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, you know, like in the workplace, comedy is the first thing that goes, you're like, yeah, how about you just don't joke around? You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's like non-essential. It's, um, the first thing to to be thrown overboard. And I feel like that's happened in the culture right now. You're like, oh, just focus on things that aren't funny. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, luckily, Madam Web is coming out and I'll put it. That's going to be funny as shit. <laughs> <laughs> you make a lot of good points, Bart. A lot of good points. You're a very thoughtful kid. You remind me of Deborah Carr and Black Narcissus. Subscribe to Red Cow Entertainment on Patreon for full episodes every other week.